Hi guys, in today's video we'll be looking at uh, some of the intuitions behind principal component analysis, which is a very popular um, unsupervised learning method uh, that's used for dimensionality reduction and uh, for visualization. Uh, we're not going to focus on the dimensionality reduction aspect of it, but more just like the intuition behind how it works uh, and why it works the way it does. So I'm going to go into uh, creating a new Kaggle notebook here. Um, and for today's uh, video, we're going to use the Iris data set just so we have some sample data. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to import all, everything we need today, which is NumPy and Pandas uh, for working with the data. For visualization, we'll be using PyPlot and Seaborn. And we'll be getting the data from sklearn.datasets. And we'll have to scale it, and then we'll apply the PCA here. So let's go ahead and import all of this. And we're going to get the data, store it in x and y, using sklearn.datasets.loadiris. Uh, so this will just load the famous iris dataset. Uh, here it will specify return x and y as true, so that we get them back as two variables here and also um, as frame equals true, so we get it as a pandas data frame. So now x is the, our data, y is our labels. We don't really need the labels today because we're not doing any supervised learning, um, but x will be useful to us. So let's, uh, let's just put a markdown block, um, getting started. And then down here we're going to start with um, prepping the data. So it's not exactly pre-processing, um, well, yeah, I guess we can call it that. Basically, what we want to do uh, is we want, we're going to limit x to two dimensions so that we're able to visualize it. So x currently looks like this. We're only going to use the sepal length and petal length columns. So x.loc, uh, all rows, and then just target sepal length and petal length. Uh, and that will give us two-dimensional data. So we're going to pretend this is our data set. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is because we can visualize it in two dimensions. So that will allow us to get a better sense of what's going on. All right, so I'm going to overwrite x just so that we uh, have this two dimensions. Uh, and then I'm going to scale x. So why don't I just include this, making x two-dimensional. Uh, and then we'll scale x uh, so that we center it uh, at the origin. And this is very important for PCA. PCA sort of uh, assumes that you've already done this. It requires that every column is centered at zero. So we're going to use the standard scalar from this. Uh, that's from sklearn. The standard scalar will shift and scale each column so that every column has a mean of zero and a variance of one. So that will accomplish what we want. We're going to call scalar.transform on x to do that. And I'm going to turn it back into a data frame afterwards since the scalar's transform function returns a numpy array. I'm going to keep the indices as they were, and I'm going to keep the column names the same as they were as well. And we'll store this back in X. Okay, so we run this. Uh, we got a problem. Oh, we did. We forgot to fit the scalar. Okay, so scalar dot fits. Actually, all we have to do is call uh, fit transform instead of just transform. Run this again. Okay, now we look at x, and you can see it's been scaled. We just have two-dimensional data that's been properly scaled now. Uh, and now we can apply the PCA. Applying PCA. So um, we're going to be applying PCA without dimensionality reduction. So what I mean uh, is we are not dropping any, any of the principal components. Because we only have two here, it's really just, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a shifting of the, of the way we're looking at the data, which I'll go into in just a second. So we're going to create a new PCA object that's coming from PCA. Uh, this is from sklearn. And we specify the number of components to use. In this case, we're using all of the components, which is just two. So we'll leave it like that. Then uh, we will call PCA.fitTransform. Uh, on x to get the reduced data. Actually, it's not reduced. I don't know. I, I'll call it xpca. Okay, xpca is just the um, the data with pca applied, and this also returns a numpy array. So let's go and turn it back into a data frame afterwards. 
This time I keep the indices the same and I set the columns to be PC1 and PC2 because we no longer are dealing with the same features. We've now generated these new principal component features. Um, and let's uh, run that. Oh, I forgot to. Okay. And XPCA should look like this. So we have this original data and this new PCA data. And it's the same number of rows, the same number of columns in each. What's 150 by 2 in both of these. But um, you'll see what the difference is to, uh, right now. So we will visualize uh, what PCA is doing. So what I want to do is I'm going to create two plots side by side. And so I'll create a new pie plot figure. Uh, so it'll be 20 by 10. That's, sorry, the fig size uh, will be 20 by 10. And then we're going to create two subplots. Uh, so plt.subplot in a 1 by 2 grid. We'll have the first one and then the second one. Um, and in each of these, I'm going to plot a scatter plot. So plt.scatter. Um, and let us, yeah, okay, so in, in the first one, I'm going to plot this X uh, data, and in the second one, I'm going to plot the XPCA data. So um, it's important to note that this has been centered at zero, and afterwards, this will still be centered at zero. So we'll be able to visualize these two sets of data on the same sort of scale. So I need the X uh, values, which will be given by uh, the sepal length uh, column and the y values will be given by the petal length column. So I'm going to graph the sepal length uh, or the petal length against the sepal length. Here so here's our x. So we're going to take just that column uh, and then on the y we're going to take just this column. Um, and then down here I'm going to do the similar thing but using the principal components. So this is xpca using the pc1 column and XPCA using the PC2 column. And let's look at this. So here's the data. Um, and you'll notice it's not on the same scale, right? Uh, the scales are a little different. So let's go and uh, make those two scales the same. Uh, we'll just take a look at what kind of values we have. Looks like the largest value is 3. So what I'm just going to do is set the X limits to, from negative 3 to 3 and the Y limits uh, from negative 3 to 3. All right, now they're on the same scales, and you'll notice these are very similar. In fact, the data has not really changed at all. The relationships between the data have not changed. All that you can really see is that there's sort of a rotation going on um, between this and this. So let's uh, let's make this a little nicer. Let's give them some titles. Uh, the first one will just be some two-dimensional data. And the second one here is going to be uh, the same data uh, after PCA. So um, how can we sort of get a better sense of why what, what it's doing here? Okay. Um, also, let's give it some axis labels. So we have X label and Y label. Up here, this is going to be our sepal length and our petal length. And down here will be our PC1 and our PC2. All right, so these are looking pretty good. Um, but yeah, I want to understand why it's doing this and how it's doing it uh, in this way. So essentially, um, and I'll get into this in a little bit, but the way that it calculates uh, the, the way it's doing this shift is, is by calculating the direction of greatest variance in this data. And what you can see, if you look at the, if you, you can look for this with your eye when we're looking in two dimensions, uh, the, the direction of greatest variance is like this. It's like this, this line here across which the data is most spread out. And so if you look at that line, and if we were to use that line as the new x, core, uh, x axis, that's what we have here. So the new the x-axis, which is PC1, uh, is that line that we originally had. So how do we calculate that line? Well, it turns out 
uh, that we can actually get that vector running through it by taking the finding the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix of x. So I'll go into what this all means in a sec, um, but we're going to calculate it first so that we can just visualize it. So I'm going to create um, some eigenvectors, uh, some eigenvector, uh, an eigenvector data frame, I guess. So it's the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. We can get the covariance matrix with numpy.cov of x. Um, however, this is actually doing it in the wrong direction. It's using each row as a feature. So we want to do x.transpose so that it uses each column. And so this is actually taking, uh, this is the covariance matrix. Uh, let me just, let me just bring this up real quick to show what the covariance matrix is. Um, essentially is this. Uh, if you look at, this is just from Stack Exchange, uh, you can see if you have three variables x, y, and z, then the covariance matrix shows the covariance between one variable with every other variable. So on the diagonal, you just have the, the covariance of a variable with itself, which is just the same as the variance. So you have variance of x, uh, and then you have variance of x, a covariance of x with y, and covariance of x with z. Uh, and then over here, you'll have covariance of y with z, and the variances are, again, on the diagonal. And you'll see that this is always symmetric. Um, because it doesn't matter if you're taking covariance of uh, x1 with x2 or x2 with x1, that's the same thing. So you have a symmetric matrix. Um, and it actually turns out to satisfy a, a, a further condition of positive semi-definiteness uh, of a matrix. And the, the, you don't have to understand what that is, but just know that when we do have that condition satisfied, we're able to calculate the eigenvectors using the singular value decomposition of the matrix. Um, which again, you don't really have to understand how it works. If you want to look up uh, the, the actual process to calculate the SVD, uh, you can. But uh, for our purposes, all we need is to to know that it works. So we're going to do uh, numpy.linalg.svd to calculate the eigenvectors um, of the matrix. So the SVD returns three um, three arrays. That would be U, S, and V, which are um, this is the singular, singular value decomposition. Uh, if you want some sh small intuition of what it's doing, um, essentially, it's it's breaking a matrix transformation down into three different parts, uh, which would be a rotation, a scaling, and then another rotation. And you can see that uh, there's there's this nice little graphic here. Um, let's look at this right here. So if you have some vectors, and this is a transformation of the vectors, and let's say it's a shear like that, you can do the same transformation by breaking it down into three parts. First, using V, a, which is a rotation. Um, after that, you will use uh, the S, or here it denotes it sigma, uh, which is the scaling. Um, and then finally, uh, you'll have the U, which is another rotation to create the original transformation, but broken down into three parts. So this is just a brief uh, intuition of the singular value decomposition. Don't worry too much about that. Just know that this U part is the eigenvector matrix. Uh, so the columns of it are the eigenvectors when the matrix you're performing this on is symmetric, positive, semi-definite. So don't worry about all that. Let's just know this is how we're getting the eigenvectors. So. We just care about u. We don't really want the u, s, and v. So we're just going to take the first thing it returns, which is just the u. And this is the eigenvector matrix. So I'm going to call this eigenvectors. Um, and let's turn it into a data frame, right? So I'll turn it into a pandas data frame. Here, uh, yeah, we don't have to give it give the, the columns names or anything. Let's just look at those. All right, and we'll also calculate them for the PCA. Now, this is a little um, unnecessary. We'll just do XPCA instead and call these PCA eigenvectors. Um, the reason it's unnecessary is you see it actually will generate the identity. Well, it's not technically the identity because there is a negative direction here. Uh, but this is 1, 0, 0, 1, um, which is, uh, as you'll see, uh, I'll show, let's just graph them and you'll see. So 
let's uh, plot each of these vectors um, as as an arrow on the uh, chart on the graph. So right here and right here, um, we're going to do plt dot arrow, and uh, each of these is going to take an x, a y, a dx, and a dy. So essentially the x and y are the starting positions of the vectors, which is just the origin, so 0 and 0. And the same over here, 0 and 0. Um, and the dx is the new, like, the, the head of the, of the vector, uh, dx and dy. So these are giving us those. So this is going to be the dx, um, which would be what we call it, eigenvectors. So, eigenvectors. You know what? Why don't I call them x eigenvectors? Okay. So we have x eigenvectors. Uh, dot iloc. Zero, zero. So that just means the first value. Then for the dy, that's going to be uh, just this second value here. So that would be. Uh, one, uh, zero, one. Actually, okay, wait, give me one sec. I just want to make sure I'm doing this right. Right, so I'm, I'm a bit off. Uh, what we should be doing is, instead of this, we just, we just, uh, make this one. Because essentially, um, this vector is the, the first eigenvector. Um, so this would be, uh, this is the x coordinate, and this is the y coordinate. You know, I realize that it doesn't matter for this particular problem because it's a symmetric matrix. Um, but I just want to get it right. This is one eigenvector, uh, and this is the other eigenvector. So it should be x and y like that, I think. Uh, so we'll just leave it like this. The width here, uh, let's just give it a width of 0 0.05 uh, and a color red uh, and a label of PC1. Um, because this eigenvector is actually the principal component. Uh, and then we'll do the exact same thing for the second eigenvector. So this will be PC2, and that's going to be uh, this right here. Um, so we just change this, uh, these two to one. Now we're dealing with the second column instead. And this will make yellow. Uh, and then let's do exactly the same thing for the PCA. So I'll just paste that in. Only thing is instead of x eigenvectors, we're doing the PCA eigenvectors now. PCA eigenvectors. All right, let's look at this. All right, uh, let's actually look at the legends real quick. So right here and right here, plt.legend. All right. So, um, this is what's happening, right? We're taking the eigenvector, and we're make, we're using it as the new uh, basis vector, or we're using it as the as the new axis, right? And this and you'll see that uh, the PCAs are always perpendicular to each other. So in two dimensions, this just right now is looking like a rotation, um, so that we're using uh, our new features are essentially um, axes within the data. Uh, that describe the data better than our original features. Because here, uh, the PC1 is really descriptive of the data because there's so much variance uh, across that axis. Whereas before, the variance of sepal length and the variance of petal length are fairly similar to each other. Uh, now, PC1, the variance is much longer than the variance of PC2, which only has a variance of about this much, whereas PC1 is like this whole axis. Um, and actually, in higher dimensions, uh, PC1 will always have the greatest variance, PC2 will always have the second greatest variance, and it will go in descending order. Okay, so um, now we can, we can definitely see that the eigenvectors uh, are describing the directions of greatest variance in descending order. But why is this? So now let's move into a more like theoretical part of the video. Um, and for this, I'm going to use this fantastic tool from shod.io um, called 
uh, it's, it's a linear transformation visualizer inspired by 3blue1brown, who I totally recommend if you haven't checked him out. He's an amazing YouTuber. Um, and this uh, is a fantastic tool designed around, uh, based on his videos. So what this tool allows us to do is see what happens to a space when we apply a linear transformation. So uh, if you're not sure, a, a matrix describes some sort of linear transformation of space. So this is the identity matrix. This means that there's gonna be no uh, transformation applied. If, if this yellow vector uh, is a vector of our choice choosing, it can be any vector, and these red and, and green vectors are the basis vectors. So these red and green vectors um, actually, uh, these red and green vectors are just describing the basis we have, right? And then this red, these little mo uh, targets we can move around describe the new locations that the basis vectors will, will go to after we apply the transformation. Let's turn off this in and out vector and just see what, see what that does. If we now apply the transformation, you can see that those vectors now move to their new locations. And with that, the transformation of space is applied. If we change this a little, we do like this, it's a different transformation of space, right? So we could do some sort of rotation. That would rotate and shear. Uh, we could just do uh, pure rotation. Oh, sorry, that's not, it should be uh, like this, right? Uh, it's not quite pure, but uh, there we go. No, no, <laughs> I can't figure it out. <laughs> Uh, there, anyway, you can do rotations, you can do shears, you can do scales. Uh, a scale, just a scaling operation uh, would just be like this. It'd be just scaling the, the space up and down, no shearing, no rotating. Um, and you'll notice that when we have a scaling operation, it's always a diagonal matrix. There's zeros in all of the non-diagonal entries. Okay, so that's just a brief introduction to like uh, linear transformations and matrices and how you can express these transformations of space using these different uh, matrices, right? So if we have some vector now, this is any vector we like, um, you can see what will happen to the vector as we apply the transformation. So you can see uh, this was the original location of our vector, uh, and the original space is, is given by these gray grid lines behind, and the new uh, space is given by these blue grid lines in the front. Um, and you can see that this yellow vector we have is is going to a new location. Uh, and whichever vector we have will always go to a new location. Um, unless, of course, uh, we're, there's some identity transformation going on like this. Uh, in this case, if, if we have uh, nothing's happening to the green vector, so there will be nothing going on to a vector that sits on that line. Um, but in most cases, uh, the or any yellow vector we have will be uh, will be knocked off uh, its, from its original location, right? So, um, why, why all this? Uh, because, let's, let, let's, let's apply the transformation, and now we can actually move this around and see what will happen to each vector for a given transformation. You can see it's going all over the place, and it very rarely sits uh, on its original spot, but you can see there are positions where it does sit on its original spot. Um, and what we're more interested in than rather it hitting its actual position is just does it hit the uh, the same like line, this the same span uh, as the original vector. And you can see this is actually a place where it does, uh, where this is the, the new vector is just a scaled version of the original vector. Uh, and there's actually not many places in this in this uh, transformation where that's the case. Usually, uh, the new vector is knocked away from the old vector. However, you can see there are certain points, right, like here, where uh, the vector is on the same span as the original vector. Uh, and in fact, there's actually only two directions, one being right here. Uh, so you can see that's right. If we get, if we get that just right, you can see um, it stays on the span. And the other one being right here. Uh, and that also stays on the span. And those two locations, the, those two vectors, are the eigenvectors. So we actually show eigenvectors here, and you can see there they are, these orange lines are the eigenvectors. The eigenvectors are just vectors where the vector, 
um, it was not knocked off its span when you apply this transformation. So let's say uh, we undo the transformation. Uh, because we know this is lying on an eigenvector, now when we apply it, you can see the new vector is still on the same span um, as the old vector. Uh, if we move this up here, which was the other eigenvector, and we apply the transformation, the same thing happens. However, if this is anywhere else other than being on an eigenvector, when we apply the transformation, it gets knocked off the span. Okay, so now we understand eigenvectors a little and what they are in, from an intuitive perspective. Uh, let's look at covariance. So covariance um, is basically a measure of what happens to one variable as you vary another variable. So these, this uh, right here pretty much sums it up. Um, it's not a very complex topic. Essentially, when you have uh, some sort of like positive, I wouldn't say correlation because, I mean, it, it is related to correlation, but uh, covariance is more of a generalization of, of correlation. Um, you can see when, when there's a positive trend in the data, let me just open this in a new tab. When there's a positive trend in the data, uh, we have a positive covariance. When there's a negative trend in the data, we have a negative covariance. And when there's no trend, uh, we have zero covariance. So what this is saying, um, let's look at uh, let's look at this one, right? As x goes up, what happens to y? Actually, let's start with this because this is positive, right? As x goes up, y also goes up, right? As x goes down, y also goes down. In the, same, uh, in the same way, as y goes up, x also goes up. And as y goes down, x also goes down. So this is a negative, um, uh, sorry, a positive uh, covariance because there's a direct relationship between uh, what happens to y when we vary x and what happens to x when we vary y. On the other hand, we have uh, a negative uh, trend. This will be a negative covariance. And negative covariance means as we bring x up, y goes down, and as we bring y up, x goes uh, x goes down, right? So there's an inverse relationship between uh, x and y. As one goes up, the other goes down. Whereas before, this is a direct relationship. As one goes up, the other goes up. Um, then we have a covariance of zero, which is basically um, as x goes up, nothing happens to y. It stays the same. There's no um, like change in y over time, like average change over time. Um, as you vary one, the other stays the same. Similarly, as we bring y up, uh, x doesn't do anything. It stays in the same, uh, the same way, same range. So this is no covariance, this is positive covariance, and this is negative covariance. So we looked at the covariance matrix, uh, which is basically just the covariance of one variable with another uh, between all variables in the matrix. And we have learned that the PCA um, is, uh, the principal components are calculated by finding the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. So now we're going to try to see why that is. Um, we're going to look at some sample covariance matrices here. Let me just close out this stuff. Um, and so here are some sample covariance matrices. Let me just put these side by side. OK, so we're back at the matrix visualizer, and we have some examples of data with their corresponding covariance matrices. So what we're going to try to do is see how the eigenvectors are going to describe the principal components of uh, the data. So let's take off eigenvectors. Let's take off the in-out vector. And let's just start by setting up these uh, covariance matrices. So let's start with this positive one. So this covariance matrix uh, has five uh, as a variance for the um, x1. Let's, so here x1 will be our green, x2 will be our red. Uh, and so the first value here is the variance. Let me zoom in a little. Uh, this five, let's go like that. Uh, this five here is the variance of x1. So we're just going to move this up to five. Uh, and we can see the matrix we're creating up here. And this 6 is the variance of x2. So these are independent of each other, right? We're going to move this up to 6. Um, actually, we can't hit 6 here. 
Uh, so what, why don't we just, we'll do something similar. Um, we'll make this four, make this three. It'll still have the same effect. Um, okay, so we have a similar, you know, what do, why don't, uh, this is sort of annoying. I want to try to get it close to the original. I think if we do it this way, the relationship will be maintained. We just scaled by a factor of one half. So five becomes 2.5 and six becomes three. This should be, have the same effect. All right, but now the covariances um, are the relationships between the variables. So those are not independent, right? Uh, these variances alone um, describe just the variance, uh, the conditional variance of a, of a single variable without dealing with the other. Now the covariance, which is these non-diagonal entries, um, describes the relationship between the variables. So if it's positive, we're going to get some positive trend. If it's negative, we're going to get a negative trend. Um, and we're going to try to create that. So note that they always have to be the same uh, because a covariance matrix is always symmetric. So if one is 4, the other has to be 4. You can see down here, if one is 0, the other has to be 0. So if we move this up by 4, uh, like so, we also have to move this up by 4. Okay, so let's see what happens now as we apply this transformation. So this is the transformation of space that occurs. Um, and now we want to see if the eigenvector, uh, the eigenvectors generated will match up with the direction of greatest variance. So here's our covariance matrix. If we show the eigenvectors and we apply the transformation, you can see the eigenvectors are uh, actually in the same shape as the uh, the the directions of greatest variance in the data. So this orange line here, which is PC1, lines up with the direction of greatest variance in the data. And this other orange line, which is PC2, lines up with the direction of second greatest variance in the data. Um, that's perpendicular to PC1. Okay, now let's look at the next one. So this is very similar, except instead of positive four, uh, we have negative four. So this is negative covariance. That means we bring this down uh, to negative four. We keep this uh, this value the same, but we're uh, varying across uh, a direction perpendicular to the axis. And since we do it on this, we also have to do it to this, bring this down to negative four. And now we have the, the matrix uh, created. Now uh, let's show eigenvectors. And you can see uh, the great, the eigenvector, you know what, because we're, we're on a new scale, let's do negative 2 and negative 2 instead of negative 4 and negative 4, just so that's a little easier to visualize. It'll still have the same effect. Uh, you can see the eigenvector with greatest, uh, sorry, you know that it's PC1 because it has the greatest length um, right here. So this length is given by the eigenvalue. Um, but with, with using the singular value decomposition, they're already ranked in terms of eigenvalue, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, this is PC1 here, uh, and you can see it is actually in the direction of greatest variance in the data. PC2 here is in the direction of second greatest variance, which is perpendicular. Uh, when you're dealing with two dimensions, um, you always guarantee, the PC2 is always just guaranteed to be the perpendicular vector. Um, but you can see that the the length of it sort of lines up with the uh, the length of variance in this data. All right, let's move on to these ones. Which uh, this one, there's no covariance, right? We have zero covariance. So we're going to move this up to five. I think this time we can actually achieve the right result. Sorry, this one goes to one. This one goes to five. Uh, and you'll see that it has zero covariance. So we're going to show eigenvectors and do the transformation. Uh, and you can see that the eigenvectors here just stay on the same axes. Um, but the PC1, which is this one, uh, you can see they still sort of mimic the direction, the full variance of the data. And the angle has not been modified. So here is PC1, uh, here is PC2, and you can see that's still demonstrated by this here. Last one we'll do is this one, which is just sort of uh, the opposite. This goes to five, uh, and this goes to one. Uh, and we show eigenvectors, and you'll see 
It's again, it mimics the shape of the data. The PC1 is showing this direction of greatest variance. PC2 is showing this direction of greatest variance. So you can now see how the, um, the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix are the principal components in the data. Okay, so uh, maybe we could just l look at how this works. Um, essentially, when we have uh, a, a covariance of zero, then the principal components are really only determined by the variances of each uh, particular uh, variable, right? Uh, when we have a covariance, that means uh, this moves perpendicular. Remember, we also have to move it up uh, equally so that it's symmetric. Um, then this eigen eigenvector shifts into the positive direction. Uh, and if we were to move the covariances into the negatives, remember it still has to be symmetric, then this longest eigenvector is shifted uh, into the negative direction. So when it becomes zero, then they're always, uh, d d they're, they're, they're just uh, in parallel to the to the axis lines, and when covariance goes to positive, then this longest eigenvector shifts into the positive direction to match uh, the positive relationship in the covariance, and when it moves into the negative direction, this eigenvector shifts down to match the negative relationship uh, demonstrated by the negative covariance. All right, uh, that will sum up today's video. So. I hope this video helped you uh, get a better sense of principal component analysis and some of the intuitions behind it. Um, I will be coming out with new content in the near future, um, but I'll see you guys later and have a fantastic day.